the poor. So madness again, jobomania. And the, so when all of this was seen, the chair of the department of uh, clinical psychology said, oh, something must be done to ignite the spirit of trying to get to know the deeper causes of things. Know the deeper causes of things so that you can be free. You can be free to be a human being proper. So one of the ways of being free proper, we have already heard, is that you should know yourself. You should know who you are. What are your sources of knowledge as an African? What are your sources of knowledge? Because those will help you understand this confusion about pecunimania, this confusion about jobomania. As a result of that, the CDBank epistemic justice lectures were established. Why justice? Because even what we learn has been imposed upon us by force. So we want to even the field. Force doesn't build anywhere. So it cannot build. It has made us victims of pecunimania, victims of jobomania. And so listening to the lecture series becomes very important because we must quench our thirst with justice. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Um, I believe then after this uh, session will really be fulfilled and will not be left wondering, not knowing who we are and where are we going. So now to hear from the horse's mouth in terms of how can we go about deconstructing and how can we go about understanding our ways of being and our way, ways of living together and our ways of healing. Um, we do have our own ways as African people in Africa and those Africans in diaspora also they are wondering are they carrying their own ways wherever in the globe they find themselves. But we'll hear from Professor Zetu Kakata who is a professor of psychology at the Department of Psychology at the University of South Africa. Her scholarship interests are in indigenous African ways of understanding human sciences, particularly psychology. African psychology, re-Africanization of curriculum through language. She also explores phenomena such as name and naming practices, ethics around studying indigenous phenomena and research methodology. She has published on the need to center African knowledge in higher education curriculum with titles on the spiritual meaning of what is today known as Lobola, the cultural embeddedness of African psychology and the spiritness of African knowledge. In her work, she also edges metaphoric language as the reliable site of African epistemologies Zetu previously worked as a researcher and lecturer in institutions such as Statistics South Africa, Department of Psychology at the University of Pretoria, and Human Science Research Council. She was recently awarded Teaching and Learning Award by UNISA for her scholarly contributions in teaching, research, and community engagement. She has recently published a co-authored book titled Still to be Named, an exploration of African epistemologies using Simpue Dana's selected works. Ladies and gentlemen, I hand to you Professor Zetu to take us through her lecture this afternoon. Thank you.
I would like to start by greeting. There's something I want to do and it's distracting, <laughs> but I will greet first. Uh, to senior management, uh, uh, Professor Macha Erasmus and other members of management present here today, uh, members of the Department of Clinical Psychology, the chair of the department, Professor Lesiba Baloi, Professor Ramose, and organizers of SFD Bank Epistemic Justice Series. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends who are joining online, especially the members of the Association for Black Psychology in the United States. I know you, you had to wake up very early for this lecture. I greet you, Ndiani Wulisa Dumelang. Before I start, I'm, go I'm glad there are students here. <laughs> Because I've got an exercise before I get into my lecture, would you quickly do, a, do an online search of this title, Okukauka Gwembeleko, which is in Isikosa. It's a novel by D.M. Jongilanga. So quickly search what related terms that you find when you look for this title. And later on, when I speak uh, on the second section of the lecture, we will talk about that. I will keep this here because I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. So as a way of introduction, I would like to reiterate my title today, which reads as Eye to Indlela Yogupilisana. Being of healing also requires the, the reading of indigenous epistemologies by us indigenous people with love. Uh, Professor Poloi requested me to come and speak here today. And he asked me to do the lecture I did ab about a few months ago. I'm not sure if it was wise of me to refuse to do that because most people have watched the lecture. If you want to hear it, it is available online. But what I did is to incorporate the aspects from the lecture into what I wanted to say about reading our works with love as indigenous people. So the first part of the title, which is Inisikosa, draws from the lecture I presented two months ago. In that presentation, I focused on the beauty, on beauty as a way of calling to the fore our ways of knowing. That have ensured that we continue to exist as beautiful people. For this lecture today, I will entwine beauty with the concept of love, because literature shows us that without love, we have not been able to see the beauty that we possess. Beauty and love are therefore used in this presentation to protest the grotesque ways we were made to appear in scholarship, the ugly ways we were made to appear in scholarship. Mm. Bearing in mind that an entire education system was founded on the message of ourselves as ugly people, and schools were built in order to train our minds to believe the lie of our ugliness. Uh, Stephen Biko, as well as the scores of our forebears, were made out for pointing this fact out, that there should be something fundamentally wrong with this education that makes indigenous children to no longer look at themselves with love once they come into contact with it. An education presented as light as civ and civilization, yet it leaves those upon which it is imposed in worst conditions. A young scholar by the name of Sima, Simi Ngonapaka de Sikin, laments in her analysis of the concept of civilization, which Amatosa translates to Imbutuko. 
Sike Nula means this. She explores the concept because uh, she explores this concept because of her father's uh, haunting assertion that what kind of a civilization is this that leave people with nothing? We have, we have all been haunted by this question. What kind of education that is set on presenting us, the indigenous people, as coming from lack? Even when there is evidence of how enough we are, it seems impossible to own such evidence. I come from the, co the same community as Biko and Sigen. And there are assertions about Western education and its civilizations. Are the questions ordinary people from my community have been asking. Questions about the type of education that causes indigenous children to look at their backgrounds with shame and disdain, as Steve Biko frames it. To look at their homes with questioning eyes and to not see the beauty in the images of themselves. Here I argue that we do have a year to Inlela Yogupilisan, our own ways of doing life, our own ways of healing. They impose Western education that has been a part of us since the 1800s. 1800s operates from a design that allows us to see the beauty of other lands, to marvel at the greatness of other people's systems. In psychology, we are supposedly trained in the ways people heal, ways of ensuring wellness and functionality, ways of understanding human behavior, and dealing with challenges associated with it. As Prof. Ramosa just pointed us to some of the challenges we are faced with of chasing money and jobs <laughs> and also of intoxication. We are trained to look into those and find solutions. What attracts many of us to this discipline is the very prospect of being of healing I have seen this on the faces of many students that I supervise. Only about two days ago, a student sat in my office and told me that, knowing that I can be there for people, but I do not want to do it as a clinical psychologist. A challenge to us again, Prof. <laughs> How can we make the student want to do it the way that she feels it should be done? This reminded me of another interaction with a student again, whom after sharing pleasantries and spoken briefly about her research prog progress, she looked me, she looked me, she looked me, she looked me into my eyes and inquired, when a prof, are you well? I'm not sure. Okay, sorry. Uh, Ati, when a prof, are you well? I got very scared <laughs> because I truly f felt the sincerity of her question. She was inviting me to her healing space. Uh, from her understanding, I too am supposed to be well. I felt the sincerity for the second time while reading the transcripts of her, of her raw data. While, I'm sorry. While she invited me to her healing space during our consultation, to her participants, she appeared to be asking for healing herself, seeking clarity on very specific issues of her research question. I got to understand for the very first time why she chose that particular topic to explore, not the reasons she had explained to me when we initially spoke. To deal with the parts of herself that needed healing. At the end of the journey, she would have learned to be both a healer and a patient at the same time 
because that is part of our ways of doing. You can be many things simultaneously with no contradiction. I believe that our students act the way they do, not because they are psychologists in training, but because Bangabandu. They come from Isindu. It is such interactions with students and everyone around me that have, that have caused me to come to conclude that this is what psychology is to us indigenous people. We understand life as reciprocal. We have our own way of ukupilisana. Ukupilisana means healing as well as ensuring harmonious existence in whatever space we occupy, either our communities, our family, or neighborhood. As I just said now, this is no contradiction to African epistemology. One thing means many other related aspects with no contradiction. These examples are some of the hints that there are other ways of being of healing and the students can sense them. When the students said Iandi Pilisa, meaning being of healing to others heals me too, she was communicating the strength of reciprocity, the beauty of Ubuntu, that we draw strength by being ethical to reciprocity. Ukupilisana is the way of being one another's healers. I heal you and you heal me too. To be entrusted with the responsibility to train psychologists is to allow them space to be abandoned, to be in, to be in life in the way they know how, that we are supposed to allow them. What is clear in the above examples and perhaps for, from the interactions I usually have with many of my students is commitment to harmony. Harmony is, in its course is referred to as invisiswano, kuhutlisana, if I'm pronouncing it well. Invisiswano is reciprocated energy. It is derived from the word ukuvisisana demanding a mutual understanding amongst those who share space or who are in interaction, which also means ukupilisana. I'm sure you would notice when there are funerals in our families or neighborhoods, they will always lament someone having ukupilisana. She was always striving for harmony or she was a healer to others which is a very important accolade we bestow upon a person only once the mortal journey has been completed. I hear in today's time people always ask for flowers while they are still alive, a concept that I really do not understand because you are still living. Only when you pass this plane will be able to tell whether Ugupilisana Gagulena Bandu. Ugupilisana is the foundation for harmony. I use these examples to demonstrate that we live the phenomena, we live the knowledge, we become the knowledge. Hence, I always say that our psychology is in our daily practices. We heal, we heal, we heal, we heal, we heal, we heal, we heal. Therefore, to have knowledge is to be alive. Amakosa say upilile as an indication that you have demonstrated the essence in you. Whenever they want to say you are deep uh, or you are a dependable person, we can rely on you. Whatever is positive they want to communicate, they would say upili that there is life in you, there is essence in you an indication that you have demonstrated the essence, as I said. This is used in conjunction with the saying, 
meaning you have shown us your humanity. So Ukupila is when you have been of life to those around you. As it, as it is always the case with African epistemology, Ukupila, as it is always the case with African epistemologies, Ukupila also has other relational meanings and applications. Being alive and being part of the community is also referred to as Ukupila. The reciprocal actioning of Ukupila becomes Ukupilisan, a mutual obligation to be of life to one another. This is what I label as AA to Indlela Yokupilisana. Our psychology means being of life to those around us. We draw this life from ourselves and we can truly access it appropriately when we gaze it into our lives with the lens of love. That is where the topic about love comes in because we need to read ourselves with love. Let us go back to the exercise I requested us to do at the beginning of the lecture. Who was able to do the search <laughs> about the book? I also understand that there is no network in the venue. So I give the answers myself <laughs> um, as I go along. But at least now you know how Ukutau Kwakambelego is spelled, so I won't have to worry about that. And also there are two more words. I won't go into the slides, but you must just quickly read what they mean so that when I go through the lecture, I don't have to explain. So the first part is Amakaba. The second one is Amakoboga. Amakoboga. The people who are pierced, meaning those people who were converted <laughs> by both Christianity and Western schooling. They were, they were psychological wars between Amakosa brought about by the colonial invaders. So they gave uh, one another names. The one group was called Amakaba because they rejected Western education or Abandu Ababovu. This is because they were identified by the red ochre they applied on their faces. It, they are called Abandu Ababovu, the red people, or Amakaba, those who smear the ochre. Imbola, yes, closer. So those two words are still uh, very important uh, in the Eastern Cape communities. And they still carry the same psychological pains as they did back in the 1800s when uh, Western education was being imposed. So why do I say we need to read ourselves with love as indigenous people? As said in the introduction, we are trained in ways that blind us to these beautiful ways of knowing, such as Ukupilisana and ways of being in life. We are trained to never look at ourselves with love. This makes it impossible to receive our work with love. Because of this, we often miss the text meant for our healing. We miss the medicine, for example, from healers such as Professor Romose, because we are often told to read with a critical eye. And this only applies to works that are written by us indigenous people. Nobody in my life has ever told me to read Foucault with a critical eye. And nobody dares to criticize people like Foucault when I do cite them just to test in my work, no one will ever, no reviewer will ever touch them. But anything that is written with an indigenous name is questioned to the core. While there is nothing wrong with applying a critical eye when handling any text, 
it becomes problematic when that is made the only way to gaze into indigenous African epistemologies. This prevents us from even hearing what our theorists are saying because we are always looking for what they should have said. When we fall into this trap of only gazing at our knowledge negatively, we fail to make meaning of our interactions with life, with our students. We fail to receive their healing. I decided to use a once very popular novel titled Ukutkauka Kwembeleko, loosely translated as the breaking of a baby blanket, a symbolism of a very dangerous situation. To demonstrate the absence of, to demonstrate that the absence of love when we embark on reading the indigenous work induces an inability to read. The novel is often described as an illustration of Isikosa gender socio-cultural relations. The reason I said you must look into what you find uh, into related terms with this novel. I wanted you to see that this is actually used quite extensively in gender and feminism works. It is used it is as used a gender, used gender, gender. Used. critique of African cultures. This novel is about a young woman who was at boarding school in the 1940s. It was written in the 1960s but is set on life around the 1940s. This young girl was forced to marry a young man, or should I say a young boy, <laughs> or she, she has never met. She, re, she retaliated by doing every scandalous act she can possibly do in her marital home, with the hope that they will give up on her and send her home. <laughs> And they did not do that. <laughs> uh, she ran away. They found her. They brought her back. Uh, and she ended up murdering her husband and running away. She was, of course, apprehended by law enforcement, enforcement ser and served her sentence. After her release, she attempted to reconnect with a boarding school boyfriend. But upon learning about that, a jealous ex-girlfriend killed the boyfriend, and that was the end. So the novel is a tragedy, obviously. <laughs> but it was really popular because I think a lot of people enjoyed the representation of women as not submissive, as very strong, and to to most of us who live in Sikosa culture, we were not really <laughs> moved by that. We actually saw it as a reflection of our rahatis as we know them, our mothers as we know them. As I was reading that, actually we read it when I was doing Standard 7. I know it's a great now, it's grade 9. <laughs> yeah. I, when I read it, I smiled because I was thinking good that about my Rahati could easily do this. <laughs> my mother could is like you could associate with so many you could associate it with so many women in our lives. So it was just a reflection of women as we know them. But because in text in scholarship we are fed a particular idea about <laughs> African women, <laughs> the people we are the skin we are in as these submissive creatures that we've never seen. Some of us really never seen, have never seen an African woman. I'm closer, so it's difficult for me <laughs> to point. I mean, not an African woman, a submissive woman. I do not have an example of that, of a woman who would just submit and she will claim to be closer. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, so going back to why I chose this novel. Uh, the novel, for obvious reason, is a popular site of critique of this culture that is abusive to women. 
It is also a demonstration that uh, often in these uh, dissertations that uh, have been written on this novel, they often argue that the fact that Zolega, Zolega was in high school at the time, Zolega is the main character, the fact that she was not submissive is owed to Western education. So they say educated women are not as submissive, therefore educa Western education is an important intervention. Uh, so what I am arguing today is that, in fact, in this novel, how I have read it, it, they are right that women are not submissive, and I'm not sure if it's entirely true if they owe that to Western education. I think um, there could be uh, numerous reasons. Also about this novel, it is in fact men who showed no resolve, even when patriarchy went against them. Because this guy who was forced to marry the girl, he also didn't want but did nothing. He kept repeating that I am bound by my father's rules. Uh, that is the gendered critique that is often provided. We use this novel to read, uh, uh, to, to, to gain this gendered lens into the lives of women at that time in both rural and urban Eastern Cape because it's set in both settings. However, a closer read of this novel introduces a few critical aspects that I have missed since I was introduced to it in the 1990s. These aspects that I got to take notice of in only in 2021, during the lockdown, when I decided to take another look at this novel. During my lockdown reading of the novel, I realized that the author D.M. Jongilanga was pointing us to the deadly impact of colonialism on its closer culture. For the purpose of this lecture, I am going to explore two excerpts from the novel that illustrates Johnny Langa's skillful critique of colonial violence and how it em embeds, often unnoticed, onto the cultures of the colonized. The novel is often presented as the, dis um, as the depiction of two conflicting worlds, the traditional world, which is the cultural, and the modern world, which is the colonial. It is often analyzed in numerous gender studies texts as a depiction of an oppressive African culture and how Western education empowers women to stand up against it. On the contrary, I argue that this novel is actually about the disruption of indigenous cultures by colonialism and what became of the disrupted people. John Ilanga, throughout the novel, cleverly points the reader to, to both the rural and urban communities that interacted with colonialism. The fact that the novel begins on the 24th of December, 1945, yet life is depicted as normal. There was no fanfare about Christmas. I mean, that was telling on its own. There was also an important dialogue in the novel that makes it, uh, that exposes the intention of the author as well. Where, in this conversation, Somebody spoke of store-bought groceries as an indication of tough times, of famine. That is how people interacted with colonialism, because they believed in self-reliance. This person is actually lamenting the difficulty uh, of not having food during the times of drought and groceries. So people saw the, what I was saying about Sike Nu's father saying, what kind of civilization is this? People saw this as not uh, as grand as it was presented to us, this civilization that they didn't buy into it. This is actually hunger and poverty. 
where we are meant to buy food that we can produce. Uh, however, it is not until page 26 of the novel that John Ilanga writes pointedly about the parallels between Isikosa culture and the culture that emanated from the people's conversion for, to, to Christianity or Western education. What many readers often pro portray as traditional Isikosa culture, even this forceful marriage in this novel is often read as a traditional culture. But Jongilanga on page 26 does say, this is actually what is in between a Sindhu and the imposed, cul imposed culture, either through education or through, uh, 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 through Christianity. I won't read the English parts uh, of what I want to share, which is taken from page 26 of the novel, because very few people here understand Isikosa. So it defeats the purpose. I will just read the translation, which is by no means perfect. So John Ilanga says on page 36, 26, in fact, it is my belief that the reason why we do not see much damage in the daughters of Amagaba is that their parents do not treat anything as taboo. They get taught about everything about being a wife when they get to a certain age through such practices as Indonjane. And he goes on to list other practices. Then he, he goes on to say, amongst Amakaba, when a man and a wife notice that their son does not show much interest in dating, they seek help for him. <laughs> uh, uh, I believe that we would have peace. We wouldn't have children out of wedlock and marriages that end in divorce after such a short time if the father would sit with his son when the right time comes and arm him with life skills, and if mothers could do the same with their daughters. That is what John Ilanga says. He consolidates this argument about how disruption of the people's ways is the reason for this strategy towards the end of the novel on page 87, when the lawyer who was defending Zolega in her meta case states, if Ikazi, which is now called Ilobola, if Ikazi was treated as the daughter's and her children's inheritance, it was as it was done in the olden days, instead of treating it as repayment to the father, we wouldn't be here. So here he explains how actually what today we call Ilobola was done. If Ikaz was not perceived with evil eyes or as a way of getting rich quickly for the father, we would be going about our domestic business today. I consider both the excerpts as the core contribution of DM Jamilanga. Here he provides a decolonial analysis of his Ikosa culture and key to his analysis are the contrasting identities of Amagaba, uh, which is the unconverted people, those who rejected Western education, and Amagaboga. What has been misread as the traditional stance is in fact a consequence of the disruption of the actual Isikosa culture by colonialism, as John Ilanga puts it. Zolega's father, who is often portrayed as a traditionalist in many gender analyses of this novel, denounces actually that label and looks down on Amakaba. He is a Christianized man, hence her daughter had, had a white wedding, a wedding ceremony conducted according to Christian methods. This is an important lesson as we look into our cultures and our ways of being. We need to properly study what is presented to us as our culture. The words that are presented to us as our language. We need to read all of these texts 
written about us by our own indigenous people. I'm saying we need to read them with love, just as Jongilanga's work that spans decades. It was right in front of us, yet we never saw the excerpts that I, re I have read. I have done research on this, and I have been, I am yet to pick up an author who actually says, who actually uses uh, these excerpts, who actually looks at the book as the analysis of the disruption of the actual Isikosa culture. Because something happens when we read, especially when we read indigenous work. There is this trick that uh, in academia it often happens, where there is a central discourse at a particular time. You cannot possibly say anything else without, <laughs> it's almost like it's in the stand that everything else you say, uh, it has to be around this discourse. Even the questions you will, you will get, after you have ignored it, they will still come back to what is deliberately put. I'm not sure if it's the center or we, it's something that we are made to engage with by force, a centralized discourse. These popular discourse, I, uh, discourses, I say they are a trick for us to never read properly, especially our indigenous work. So in conclusion, I want to implore us once more, as we respond to the call by students, by our communities, and by our forebears, to bring our ways to spaces we occupy, to do so with diligence and precision. This non-reading of these crucial parts of Jongilanga's novel, despite its popularity that spans decades, emanates from not expecting life from ourselves. This causes us to fail to expect life from our writings. There is a lot of healing in the, in the old writings, and we miss it when we allow others to dictate what discourse the moment demands. How you read has a lot to do with how you feel about yourself. I believe that accessing ourselves from an angle of love will make us see the beauty of our ways. The self-love which Bandu Stephen Biko agitates will restore will restore our ability to read and to reactivate our sensibilities to text that is intended for our healing. Jongilanga, just like my students, illustrates that Sinendlela yetu yokwenza izindo. Kwaye iya We have our ways of doing things and those ways are healing to us. Thank you very much. Wow, what an insightful lecture, uh, Professor Zetu. Nyenjala yetu yegupila ngabantu, singa bantu, nebantu, bagiti. Kamu khori pidisha nangawa, nare lebatu, lebatu baborina. Kani neteri na lidisila zara na zaropila. When I'm just quoting your biography, you talking about our naming practices as African people. Your name, just you telling me who you are by your name, I can tell you who you are. In the helping professions, when our patient comes in our consulting rooms, we check first their names. In psychology, in psychiatry, we even check if this language that we're speaking, are they comfortable with this language? Because we know it is with language that you can reach this person wherever they are. Even in our families, the naming practices, you know this particular name is reserved for this particular person and for a reason. Ratzebagor or Rahadi, just by your name, and the title Rahadi, the meaning it carries. Even in, you spoke about Lobola and the precedence. If Rahadi is not there, there's nothing we can do. Even with the burial rites we've seen during COVID, a lot of our patients are coming now, 
post-COVID sequelae because of the bearing practices, the burial practices that could not continue due to COVID restrictions. As African people, we know there are certain burial rites that we need to participate in for our own healing. So our own ways of being also gives our own way of healing. This is something we need to take into our consulting rooms, those who are practicing as psychologists, psychiatrists, medical professionals, to say, when this person is coming to say, I am unable to move on because I was not able to attend the funeral of Rakhadi. Somebody will not understand what is the significance of going to Rakhadi's funeral. Rakhadi is the, my father's sister. I was named after Rakhadi. Therefore, it means I did not do right. And I will never be right until certain cleansing happens. That's when I can find closure. But we need to find a pathology. How do you pathologize that? That I did not attend Rahadi's funeral. Is that pathology? We would want to somehow fiddle and find a diagnosis. But here, the diagnosis is just our way of being. Uh, Prof. Zetu speaks about the beauty and the warmth of African people, our ways of being. The first thing is to touch the other person. When there's a funeral, the community members, they go into the morning family. That's our way of being. I was arguing with Prof. Baloy the other time that saying, this is our way of telling and retelling the story. This is our way of grief therapy. Before you even consult with psychologists, already support was provided. This is our way of being. Prof talks about Ama Koboka, Renare Babitza Majakani, Bajile Kano. Remember there was a, 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 a covenant of some sort. So when they change from that, you've changed from your ways of being. And from that, there's a, a conflict. In psychology, we can say internal conflicts that emanates from that. We might find Western theorists to try to understand why is this internal conflict? Because your way of being and this life that you are living today, there's contradiction. She spoke about the self-discrimination. This brings about the internal conflict. There are a lot of things that I can quote from her work that is relevant to us as clinicians, is relevant to us as, as scholars to say, can we really move away from our ways of being and then say we are finding solutions? So it means in our future research, in our future clinical work that we do, Part of finding solutions means we need to remember who we are. And there's one scholar who's conceptualizing a paper on how can we heal neurocognitive disorders, right? And we remember on the olden days we play games, maskitana, khati, diketo, visual planning, visual spatial, uh, cognitive, re how do I put it, executive functioning. But we can do that using our own indigenous games. And they are free of charge. Playing hat is free. Playing maskitana is free. It's cost effective, isn't it? So it means we need to remember our ways of being and even the solutions we want to bring about should really talk to us as people of the African descendants. But I would like to hand over to um, Ume Lucy. It's a PhD student in clinical psychology to allow him to respond to what Prof. Zetu has said. Thank you so much. May you see? Oh.
Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, and I'd like to thank you for coming and start off by apologizing for being late. Unfortunately, I was also a victim of money mania, <laughs> job mania. Please bear with me, but thank you for coming and for your patience. Uh, I'd like to also thank the organizers for allowing me the opportunity to respond to Prof Zetu's presentation. Um, in the interest of time, mine will be just a brief response. Uh, I will be reading into some of the insightful, some of the things that I thought were insightful Insightful, from, insightful, from insightful, insightful, presentation. Insightful, 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 um, so my approach will be somewhat unconventional in a sense that uh, my response will mainly focus on her first part of present presentation and the derivation of concepts. Okay, and then yeah, finally I will conclude with a short quote. I think it is very important to ask ourselves in relation to Prof. Zetu Kagata's uh, presentation, to ask ourselves who is the intended audience for, the, for this presentation that was just delivered. Um, and we interact and navigate, and it's also important to note that we interact and navigate the world from a particular standpoint. This, <coughs> thus it is unrealistic at times to assume that scholars should always strive to remain neutral and objective in their critical engagements. Instead, instead more realist, to be more realistic and re enriching, it, sorry, it would be more realistic and, reach, and enriching for scholars to openly pronounce the proposition from which they will address any topic of discussion or research. This view that I've just mentioned above challenges the dominant, West, the dominant Western approach of doing research and presentations. Uh, from the title of the paper presented by Prof. Zetu, Being of Healing Requires the Reading of Indigenous Epistemologies by Indigenous People with Love. It is clear that uh, Prof. Zetu seeks to engage the topic of discussion from the from the perspective of the indigenous conquered people in the unjust wars of Western colonization. Thus, I think it's no coincidence that the first part of the title is in Isikosa, which is uh, Prof. Zetu's mother tongue. It reveals, it, it, the title also reveals Prof, uh, Prof. Zetu's serious commitment to taking to taking seriously the use of African language, the use of African indigenous languages in the quest for epistemic justice and liberation. Uh, in the first part of uh, her presentation, Prof gives an account of of a to injela a mutual a mutual obligation to be of life to each other. I shall return briefly to to this topic because I have a few things just to say on, the, on that account. Uh, in the same section, which is the first part of her presentation, we learn of the relationship that Prof has with her students and how her interest in the concept of came about. Through sharing her experiences and exchanges with her students, she not only lets us into the thought processes of her students, but at the same time, she permits us to enter her own thought processes and the mind of a decolonial educator in contemporary conquer, conqueror South Africa. Um, in this regard, the critical issues that they found uh, worthy of, it, sorry, the critical issues that um, decolonial uh, scholars find worthy of exploring are thus brought to the fore. This includes taking seriously the role of culture, love, and beauty. Um, the, um, I, I found it very interesting that, uh, uh, um, sorry, this is my thoughts a bit, but um, to go back to what I mentioned earlier on, which, which was 
what I opened my, uh, my, my discussion with, that we make sense and view of the reality from a particular vantage point of view. I think the example of this comes clearly is, and is evident in the commitment of Chris Zechu students. Thus, I agree with Prof's observation that our students act the way that they do because they are psychologists, not because they are psychologists in training, but because they are and they come from Isintu. Isintu being also the cultural practice and order of Abantu. Thus, for me, it follows, it is also the basis of, of, of the philosophy of Ubuntu. Thus, for me, it follows that there is no Ubuntu without Isintu. Of particular interest to my response, my response. Uh, is Prof uh, Zetu's uh, exposition of Ogupili Sana, particularly, but particularly, particularly as she says that Ogupili Sana is the way of being, of being one another's healers. The word heal, it, interestingly, is not to be taken for granted. Understood in its etymological origins, heal means to make whole or to make whole sound or well. The question thus arises, but how? From Prof Tagata, we get the sense that healing or to make whole in the African perspective, perspectives is reciprocal. Whole in this sense does not imply static. Um, the, uh, uh, from uh, Prof Zetu's also uh, exposition, the healing pro in the healing process, there is no sharp distinction between the healer and the patient or the person who needs, who needs healing. Rather, they engage in a collective activity that aims to bring ho wholeness. Hence, Ugupilisana is the foundation of harmony. This also means that an emphasis or attention should also be placed on how we relate to each other in the process of Upilisana. Prof. Tagata also highlights the point that Amatosa say Upilile as an indication that you have demonstrated the essence in you. A question may be asked by some uh, what Prof. means by the term uh, essence in this context, as the term may be embedded with multiple meanings. Ugu Pizlisana, in my own opinion, invokes the idea and the practice of Ugu Bambisan, meaning collaborate, co collaboration or assisting one another. Being alive and being a part of a community is also enacted through the practice of Ugu Bambisana, in my opinion. To Prof Zetu's insight on Wupilisana, I would thus add and thus conclude and adjust the, <coughs> the topic a bit um, to qualify as a Tinjela, a Wupilisana, no Wubambisana. Meaning, our psychology is being of life to those around us through, uh, uh, but through assisting or helping one another. Then I will move on to the second part of Prof Zetu's uh, presentation. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get the opportunity to read the novel. So my, respo my response, because of, of time, um, uh, so my response would be just brief uh, and ask a few questions. Um, so sec the second part of Prof uh, Zetu's presentation that I received uh, yesterday <coughs> regards reading ourselves with love. In the second part of, Prof, of, of Prof's presentation, she argues that, and I quote, we are trained to never look at ourselves with love. With love. This makes it impossible to read our, our work with love because of this we often miss the text, the text meant for our healing. We miss the medicine from healers such as Prof. Ramose because we are told to read with a critical eye. And this only applies to him and those who look like him. This prevents us from, from, <clears throat> from even hearing what they are saying because we are always looking for what they should have said. When we do that, we fail to make the meaning of our interactions with, la 
with life, with our students, we fail to receive their healing. Uh, personally, from for myself, from Prof. Kagata's quote, quote that I've just mentioned, I think now I can follow why it's better to see than look at Ramose. <laughs> In the same quote, Prof. Tagata mentions mentions the signif the significance mentions the significance of meaning when she say when she states when we do not when we do not do that we fail to make meaning of our interactions with life with our students and we fail to receive their healing the above pronouncements by prof are not to be taken lightly they point to the crisis to the crisis mode of fragmentation that is caused by a lack of meaning. This takes me to the point on meaning and the definition of meaning. The word meaning, in a sense, implies significance, value, and purpose. Meaning is at the root of our being. How we act is influenced by, by what something means to us. I am sure we can concur, especially clinical psychologists, that life has little value if and when it lacks meaning. Thus, those suffering from lack of meaning are indeed in need of healing. And the lack of meaning can blind us to beautiful ways of knowing, as Prof. Zetu mentioned. Since Prof. Uh, Zetu in this section, this second part of the section, speaks of love and the need for us African indigenous people to read ourselves with, word, with love. I think it is worth asking, what is the shared meaning of love in Isindu? Or what is, the, <coughs> what, is, what, what is the shared meaning of love from the perspective of the African indigenous conquered people? Some might find it a, wor a worthwhile exercise to inquire about the nature of love and ask if the love phenomenon is experienced and interpreted and expressed in the same manner in different cultures. I will not attempt to comment much on the novel as I stated earlier on, uh, but I shall limit my comments to just a few final observations. From what Prof has uh, presented and her interpretation uh, of the novel, I would like to ask, can the novel be read as a deliberate effort by the, by the author by the author to facilitate responsible healing for himself and the targeted audience for whom, whom the novel is directed at. If so, it would be interesting to further explore this idea in relation to love. And thus a question arises, that arises from this is, what place or role does love have to play in this pro in the process of healing. What I deduce from uh, Prof. Zetu's exposition of the novel is that culture, is that is that culture in this case is is seen to ought to be a prominent feature and catalyst in facilitating healing for the indigenous conquered peoples. This draws my attention to my conclusion, as I had mentioned, that I will conclude with a quote. And I will conclude with a quote from Amilcar Capral, when he states, history teaches us that in certain circumstances, it is very easy for the foreigner to impose his dominion on people. But it also teaches us that with whatever may be material aspects of this domination, it can be maintained only by the permanent organized repression of the cultural life of the people concerned. Impl Implantation of, for, of foreign domination can be assured, can be assured definitive, definitely only by physical liquidation of a significant part of the dominated population. In fact, to take up arms to dominate people is above all to take up arms to destroy or at least neutralize, to paralyze its cultural life. For as, for as long as they continues to exist part of these people retaining their own cultural life, foreign domination cannot be sure of its perpetuation. At any moment, depending on internal and external factors, 
determining the, evolu the evolution of, of the society in question, cultural resistance may be taken on new forms, political, economic, armed, in order to fully to contest the domination. Thus, like Prof. Zetu, I would also like to conclude with a, with a bit of, of, of encouragement of, by asking a question, a question that relates to the quotes that I've just mentioned by, uh, by uh, Amilka Kapral. And that, my question is, we ought to ask ourselves, what place has love and beauty in the resistance, in the fight and resistance against oppression? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Melissa Mbata. With an uh, intriguing response, because it leaves Prof. Z2 with uh, questions to answer. But I'll, I'll just to quote from what I heard from uh, Melissa's response when you spoke about uh, emanating from Prof. Zetu's lecture, uh, reading ourselves with love, which reminds me of um, Prof. Nsamening, who was the first person I've read his work on African development and identity formation, that as an African child, you exist because of others. I am because we are. Even my own identity as an African child emanates from the family and the culture that I come from. And also, this identity, we tend to carry it through out our life course throughout our development. That's why even from birth until the rites of passage, until you leave this world, and we know as Africans we say, you only live in the physical space, but in the spiritual space we are still connected with you. I also hear you, Umanisi, talking about Ukupilisana, you adding to saying, when we live together, we also work together. I remember, I think it was the ruling party, I don't know which year, when they were campaigning, they said, working together, we can do more. This is us African people, when we work together, we can do more. Some said, um, in the social media streets, the roads that were built by our forefathers, they are still standing, right? They are still standing, and those roads that are built by architects now, uh, South Africa and the potholes, you now choose which one is better. But because they are carrying the stones passing from one person to the other, those roads that they built, even the buildings that they built, they are still standing because they work together they live together in harmony for the better of the African nation. So it's time for the question and answer session. I would like to open the floor for question and also be mindful that there's a virtual audience. Maybe perhaps if we can uh, put your question on the chat box uh, so that we can allow um, your question to be read and then we allow the speakers to respond to your questions. But maybe perhaps as I'm allowing the cloud audience to type their questions, I would like to give the audience in the house the time to ask questions. No, thanks very much, and, and thanks for the presentation. I just want to check, especially for uh, psychologists after, after this presentation, that in, in clinical practice specifically, is it ethically correct then that somebody who's a clinical psychologist uh, is of Christian belief system should treat a fellow South African who is non-Christian, for example, uh, would, would that be ethically correct? Would that make sense uh, uh, to this uh, treating team? Yes. 
say thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I wasn't sure if the question is directed to who or to me. Anyway, uh, let me go to the writing that we saw on the board. Uh, the distinction between the people with red ochre and the people who are converted to Christianity and therefore they go along with everything, Christian schooling and colonial education. Two points, <laughs> I will be brief because I want to give others time, but you see, let us not forget that Christianity by itself is a problem and this particular problem is not generally pronounced and announced to us. When Christianity was introduced, I'm even using a wrong word to say introduced. It was actually imposed, all right? When it was imposed, we were not informed that this particular religion not generally is actually pronounced a distortion and announced to us theology when Christianity was introduced. Okay? Why a distortion? There were three people who distorted the theology of Aristotle. Thomas Aquinas distorted uh, the theology of Aristotle for Christianity. Averroes distorted the theology of Aristotle for Islam. And uh, Maimonides distorted the theology of um, Aristotle for Judaism. So these distortions, these changes, we're not told about them. And what we have accepted by imposition is a lie, okay? Because the tensions between Christians, I won't go into details, there's a lot of literature, you see, but why do I mention this? I mention this for this reason that even the ethics that is espoused by Christianity is problematical for Abandu. I will give you one example. The whole idea of heaven and hell is already a distortion. It's part of the distortion of the, the, the theology of Aristotle. Now, according to Abantu, there is no prospect, to use the word of uh, Sogolo, there is no prospect of a trans-empirical disaster. According to us, we're not going to go to heaven or hell. So, it is unethical. That's where I'm getting. It is unethical to promise somebody something which is false. To say, I, I'm not going to tell you that, you know, uh, heaven and hell are false. We wanted to discipline you by telling you about heaven and hell. In, in fact, this is, no, we, we don't want to tell you that. We make it as true. And once we have, now, if you make a lie true, you are being ethical because you are lying. So I'm saying, when we talk about Christian ethics, please let us remember the distortion, point one. Point two, if we have accepted it, let us not do like those who have imposed it. Let us not force it upon the people who come to consult us as psychologists. When they come, we must give them the option 
to actually pronounce their own religious commitment. If we are unwilling to actually give them that space, it is better for us to step up. Don't, don't impose. If we refuse imposition, especially the type of imposition which is combined with a lie, then let us not perpetuate imposition by accepting, ah, it's a mother now. Yeah, he, he must do this, he must do that, he must do that. And all that you are pronouncing is Christian ethics. Now, don't force it. I'm not saying don't do it if the person accepts it. But if the person doesn't, give them the space. Christianity is not the only and the best religion. Just like Islam is not the only and the best religion. Okay? Although the three of them tell us that they are the best. Why? Because they are monotheistic. That is metaphysical dreamland. Okay? So when you, 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 you look at religion, please let us remember that religion is not theology. Theology is a scientific defense of a religion. All right? But religion is another story. So let us respect these religions, whatever religion it is. If I don't show respect for it, let me step away. Others will, will explain what needs to be explained. Okay? Thank you. Uh, any hands? Any hands in the house? All right. Oh, yes, I'll allow Prof to, 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 to answer. There's a question here in our chat box uh, from Patricia. She's asking Prof uh, to talk more about the break, break, breaking of the baby blanket. Um, what does that mean um, in terms of our own perception of ugliness? I'm sure I don't have to stand up. Or do I? <laughs> Prof says that I should stand up. No. Uh, says Patricia, uh, the breaking of a baby blanket is a metaphor for a tragic situation. It's something you don't want to see. You don't want to see a baby blanket break <laughs> because it would bring danger to the baby. But you are making a, a critical connection because actually the reading of ourselves as ugly begins at a very young age. It, I wanted to say, maybe when I was very young, I would have said it begins the minute we enter the schoolyard. But in these days, it even begins much earlier due to other multimedia forms that make us to access the imposed way into our homes. So the minute we switch on our TVs and other forms of media, we're starting to see these notions of ourselves as ugly, as ugly people. And that trains our minds to never see beauty in ourselves. That trains our, our minds of how to look at ourselves. And so I thank you for that because it's an important interconnection that actually we are indeed trained at a very young age to, to look at ourselves with ugly eyes and to look at other people's ways with the eyes of beauty. It's a deliberate, uh, it's a deliberate strategy. Thank you. Um, we still have time for, for more questions. Even if it's a question, but uh, a comment, maybe perhaps that we can pass to the speakers just from your understanding of uh, today's lecture. Mine is just a, a thought. Um, I'm trying to think, especially from this explanation of what does it mean of, of the breaking of the baby's blanket. My thought is in the, 
this modern world that we are living in, the world of technology, like as we are here now, there are colleagues joining us from the US, right, through the media, through internet. What is the role of internet for us as Afri African people, for our own identity? Because I remember in the days when you had to tell a story or when you had to break sad news, there's a platform and there's a place and the person dedicated to do that. We've seen it during COVID. You'll see RIP on social media. But that is not our culture. Because in our culture, when we're to announce the passing of a person, there's a dedicated person who's to carry the same message across to whoever who's supposed to hear the message. I'm just thinking now, our own perception of self as African people and the influence of social media. And we cannot shy away and run away from social media. What does it do to us as people? These are just the thoughts that I have. And I wonder if um, Prof. Ramos, Prof. Zetu, do you have maybe perhaps a comment to my own thinking pattern, the influence of social media on our own perception. Just, for example, like I said, breaking the bad news. Now we see it on social media. Before you get the call home, the call from home from Rakhadi, they'll check, they'll call first and check where are you? Who are you with? What are you doing? Sit down. They are preparing you, right? Sit down. Very, it's homari. Because what we are going to share is not good. But nowadays we go to social media, you log on to your status. Eh? Because we all have social media. Somehow, if not social media, but a smartphone, you log on to your profile, you see somebody posting RIP. You have not had it properly. What does it do to you as a person? You are at the mall walking and you see RIP. But we know in our olden days, there was a way and platform to do that. I'm, I'm just wondering, what does that say about us as African people now because of social media? All right. Thanks very much. Uh, well, there is um, uh, an institution, let me call it that. It is called E-Learning Africa has to do with all that you have said. And uh, last year, they held a, an international conference in Rwanda. Uh, this year, next week, on the, from the 23rd to the 25th, there will be a similar conference, but this time in Dakar, in Senegal. So if you Click. Maybe it's a bit too late to register, but I suspect it is possible. I promise you, you will see lots of different views about what the electronic media, that the internet, what we're telling us. You will just see what it really does to us. Uh, please try and, and attend. Uh, uh, it's directed by a lady called Rebecca. It's, also, it's, it's German based in Berlin, but I think it is worth trying just so you can follow the debates there. Um, one of the things that you will notice, and I'm sure we know, is that these media, you know, they, they, we must remember, it's taken over from military technology. Now, in the military, the key word is command. We command you. You are not going to say yes, we command. All right? So, the logic of command is built into this thing that we call the uh, social media. 
um, whether you, t you when you type the word Christian and you are against Christianity, for example, um, Wallace Oyinka says, I don't like to spell Christianity with capital C because if I do so, I deny the equality of all religions, okay? Now, when you type C, Christianity with capital C, even if it is WhatsApp, when you type it, when you agree with Soyinka, and you type it with small letter C, it corrects you. you go, no capital C. You see, it's command, command, command. So one of the things that this system really kills is independent thinking. It is independent thinking. We no longer, uh, we get used to be commanded so much that we forget that actually we are free, we must command ourselves. And alongside that, it kills feelings. It kills feelings. I don't feel for you. I don't ask you like you would say. No, you know, we don't prepare you for the bad news. It just flashed in the media. I can't go there, so Utavona. I mean, and then when you get a shock, where am I? Who is near you to help you with that shock? So I'm not thinking about that anymore. It, it, your feelings and my feelings. So it is killing independent thinking. It is also killing feelings. I like very much when you mentioned feelings earlier. I mean, you mentioned the word touching. Can you imagine? Can you really imagine a mother who is unwilling to touch its own baby? Can you ever imagine? Human touch is so important. If you go to Bronco Spray, there used to be a place Cizanani, but now it is smooth, dissolved. It. Now there were all kinds of things at Cizanani, including a place where you would find children who were picked up from plastic bags, babies. So they were kept there. Oh, you could see the babies, my God. Now what interested me is that as I walked around and just had, oh, these children were Oh, say, but when you touch the little baby, it gets brighter. The eyes are out here. It doesn't know you from Adam. But just the feeling it has that I am being touched went a long way. A long, long way. Papa, papa, mama, mama, mono, hey, wano, utsu, hile. So, human touch. He's lost these days. I did. Now, can you, can you imagine also, let me go into another domain. Can you imagine a sweet at Ohanunzwar? I mean, can you see? So, uh, human touch goes with, away with these things. It goes up, it replaces so much that is humane and human. Now, that is where I see a big problem with this. I think a way of really getting closer. Oh, Kisatsu, we are not even afraid, right? And Kamutsara for sexual harassment, die. No, because I'm not there. Akeko sexual harassment, I touch you because human touch is exchange of mutual warmth. How? Mara little So, <laughs> 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 so Alright, thank you, thank you so much, Prof. Um, I'm looking at, at the chats here and I'm asked to respond to Dr. Mazibuko's question to saying, um, what does the ethics in the helping profession say about religion? Um, we don't impose, like Prof. Uh, Ramosi has said, you meet the person where they are, where you find them. And if they are of a particular religion, hence it's, it's better to be open-minded, to, to be 
how do I put it? So that when this person comes with an explanation of their problem from that particular religion, because our own African religion sometimes can be the cause of the problem. If a, a widower who is mourning and you are told to udule matras, uh, you feel like you are being subjected to this practice. Or a Christian woman was mourning, not symbolically showing their mourning. But you meet this person where they are. You're not imposing yourself because as Africans you are your own aspect of your own life. So I think it's better to just meet this person where you find them. And when you have limitations, there's nothing wrong uh, in, in referring to this person because we've got uh, clinicians who are also trained healers. We've got clinicians who are pastors. Maybe they can best help this person if you have your own limitations. I would will, I will like to wrap up the question and answer session because I think we are delayed uh, in, in, in commencement and I'm thinking other people have other commitments so I will not want to be um, stingy in that regard. So I see Patricia is asking in the US, uh, he's, she's saying in the US there's something called a uh, trauma porn, maybe because of the media and is asking if this is the case in, in South Africa or in Africa in general. I think I can say this is the case because really social media has changed the lens we use to view the world. Even our, sometimes the, our own identities are now distorted by just social media. Um, and I normally say to people that what we post on social media with these technology phones you, you call it what? Filters. You use filter, you you'd modify it so that it's, it, it is appealing to whoever you think is supposed to see that. But behind this filter, there's this neutral, natural person. W why filter almost every picture that you take? It, no, not just taking a picture and post it as it is. Why filter it? So what, what does that say to us about people? as we are filtering these pictures and posting and checking in in decent places, not checking in in certain places. So it's almost like our way of being is also starting to become distorted just by social media. Sometimes you'll check in at places that you are not even there so that people can see that you have checked in at South and Sun, Elangeni, but you're not there. What, what message are you saying? What are you saying about yourself? Is it a wish to be at South and Sun Elangeni, but your really, reality says you are in Harangua? <laughs> huh? Reality says you are in Harangua, but you're saying South and Sun Elangeni. What are you saying to yourself? So I'm thinking there's a lot that we can say about social media and us as, as African people. But for the sake of time, I think I would like to bring this question and answer session to an end. And before that, I would like to hand over to our professor and our dean of school, who's always supportive uh, to our department. I think each and every event that we have, each and every time we knock on his door, he's always, always ready and available for us. I think in my line of duty, in the years that I've been in the system, this is one of the most supportive deans that I've worked with. And it gives you joy just to serve, knowing that those who serve under their leadership are really supportive. Uh, Prof Mofunu, thank you so much. Um, over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, for me it was quite exciting to, to listen to the discourse. The, and uh, it was quite an enriching discussion. I must say that it, in, it invoked a lot of thoughts to me. And uh, it just reminded me, before I go to the formalities of, of thanking you, it just reminded me about, you know, that since the beginning of time and humanity, uh, life has been about subjugation. It has just been about conquest. So it has been the law of the jungle, it will be eaten. And it has been about Machiavellism, you know, the end justifies the means. But what I heard here 
for me as a takeaway uh, because I'm a physician, I'm a family uh, physician. The principle or the, uh, the epistemology that we advance as pedagogy is that when you treat a person, you don't treat the disease, but you treat the person, you know. Uh, so that is the pedagogy that we teach our students, to treat the person, not the disease. And the person is holistic. So it's not a list of symptoms, but it's trying to address uh, the issue behind uh, that. But what I had as a takeaway uh, of Zetu in this discourse is uh, it resonates with my training in terms of when you said harmony, for me it was homeostasis. So harmony is balance, you know. How do you obtain homeostasis? Because nature is all about finding balance, equilibrium. Uh, how do you get to homeostasis? That is harmony. But for harmony or homeostasis to be there, there must be uh, equilibrium, and that equilibrium then brings uh, that element that you say that there must be healing, you know, uh, for healing to happen, then there must be equilibrium and homeostasis in the body. So every time when we do these interventions, it's all about trying to bring that harmony. But that harmony and equilibrium, uh, that brings healing, if it's done in love, then that brings perfect healing. You know, that's when you find perfect healing, when it's done in love. So for me, I think that is my takeaway from, from, from the discourse. And I'm very, very much grateful for, for, for this uh, thought. So, yeah, so for me, it, it is my honor and pleasure really to, to be, to partake and to be invited by the head of the department, Prof. Paloi. This is the second uh, lecture series that, I'm at, that he has invited me, so I want to thank him because he's exposing my mind and my thinking. I'm sure everybody else, even the audience that is online, that has joined, I'm very grateful. Uh, so CDB and Epistemic Justice Discourse, Discourses and Program. So, and to the department as a whole, you know, and, and I can see how they are supporting each other. Like we say, Obambisad, you know, how, do, how they support each other. And I can see that as well from the chair. So I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Maipo, for being the, the program director for today. And I also like to thank our DVC, Prof. Tandi Macha, although she couldn't be with us here in person, but she was here. Like we said, now we have transcended, we have transcended uh, time. Now we are using the online uh, platform, and uh, we can be in multiple places in one, uh, at one time. And I also want to thank uh, Prof. Ramosi, uh, Ramosi. Uh, for your wisdom, insightful thinking, and of course you are provoking us to think. And really, uh, I think uh, there is a lot to learn from, uh, from your interactions. And, you know, I can't say much more than what Prof. Zetu has uh, said uh, in terms of bringing the enlightenment about uh, a lecture you know, of Ubuntu and what is it to find healing. Uh, so that was very insightful. And I would like us to give a, a, a round of applause for, for, for that input. Can we all give a round of applause? Thank you. And I was trying to browse through uh, Jolinganga's uh, book, uh, but it's a PDF. So it's a book that you have to buy, but there's a PDF uh, article. And uh, it was quite intriguing. I think you have prompted me to go and buy that book. So 
Okay. <laughs> so I'll go and make sure that I get it. Uh, and uh, our candidate, uh, Mr. Mbata, uh, I see you are going point by point. It shows for me, show that we are a good listener. And uh, you were trying to go systematically uh, through your, your answer in se uh, series to, 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 to respond to the lecture. So thank you very much. And everybody that took part in preparing, you know, we've got our TV, the, uh, you know, SMU TV, the audience on social media from every corner of the world. I learned that there are people from the US we have joined and for any other country. Uh, so thank you so much. So for me, really, I'm very grateful and I wish uh, this discourse much more uh, and to be more fruitful uh, years to come. So with those few ways, I want to thank you all and for those who made time to be physically here. So thank you very much. So with those few words, I want to say, Sia Bonga. Enkosi, reale voa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, na kita rikinuile kichoti, mosi dibens.